my mic off. Try again. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Victoria. So we have some ambient noise out here. I'm not sure how well I'll be able to keep up, keep track of you. I'll, I'll do my best. I have a whiteboard. I will also I'm position better than last one, so I'll be able to see. But if you need, like, if something's off the screen or something, do your best to let me know, and I'll try to do better on this one. And there are some notes posted for today. Um, we won't get through them all, probably, since we're doing the outside thing. It does slow us down a bit. But um, that's some backup support information for you. And we'll see how far we get. I got a little practice with my last block, so maybe I can be more efficient this time, such as we're not starting in the sun and having me watch everybody slowly get hotter and hotter and hotter and have to move. So, so a few props out here. So uh, back to deep maps. So I, I know it's uh, it's taken me a while to grade late work on that. I apologize. I was sick over the weekend, sick the last couple of days, so um, it just didn't get done then. But I am on this block. I have a few people that I have a check mark in instead of a grade. I think some of one of one or two of you have put that grade in. I've got a couple more to go. And then from here on out, it looks like uh, most, uh, I haven't seen any um, alterations. Like I don't see that anybody changed something and, and reposted it. So what I'm gonna say is don't. If you have something to add or change, I want you to post it on what I just added today. You may have seen I added a um, optional deep map number three. So deep maps overall didn't turn out to be kind of the level that I was expecting. So we thought we'd have more momentum at the beginning, but that, you know, that's fine because we have different levels of crazy going on in our lives and everything's been weird and, and momentum isn't uh, what it usually is. And yet I've had some students just do like an absolute spectacular job on them. So what am I going to do? Um, I can't incorporate it as much into the class, so I haven't been for that reason. Okay. Oh, I'm sitting on your mat. Maybe that we should put that there so you know where to put yourself. I'm doing your kind of like behave. <laughs> Merry and bright. So, uh, so anyway, is what it is. Um, um, perhaps, probably we're, we're almost out of this semester. How'd that happen? But, um, we might have you go back and fill in some identification next semester. We might actually get some momentum next semester when the weather gets nice. We might actually find insight. I don't know. It's just kind of been a little bit rough on that. But I will release um, some like some insect guides, a few places where you might have been curious about what things were. And I kept saying, don't worry, we'll look it up later. I am quite happy that you were looking up on some level, like what the class of birds is. I mean, that will get you some understanding as, as we start unfolding some of these organisms. But um, less emphasis on that than I thought there was going to be, but, but uh, you know, we'll bust out our list of uh, insect orders and a few things. To, to, so uh, people have particular interest in what something was, I might be able to help you in the future. Anyway, so if you have stuff that you have not submitted, upgrades, whatever. If it's an upgrade in the information, I've told you to go ahead and, and uh, please highlight that or I won't know where to look and I won't, I won't be able to change anything or consider changing a grade. But if you have additional, like you did get some migratory birds and that's not posted yet because you already posted yourself. If you have or that deer ran over and you got the picture, you know, if something happened and you have some information, submit it in unit three deep map, anything new. And here's what could come of that. If you have new information, I will go back into your old grades. And if they are not perfect, I can add the points into those. Okay, if they're not perfect, I can add the points into that. If you got 20 out of 20 already, you have two options. You can just not submit something, or if you're kind of into it and you want to show me your work, then I will find a way to tuck those points in somewhere. Maybe it's like a, uh, I'll, I'll do some extra credit or a note that you can skip another assignment or, you know, we'll, we'll try to find something to make it worth your, you know, to, to compensate you. I will find a way to compensate you is what I'm saying. Okay. Any questions on that? Not? Nah? Oh, dang. For a minute there, I thought that might be a Sharpie because it didn't erase. All right. Well, I'm going to have to start my lovely drawings all over the 
So what I'm uh, planning on accomplishing today, dang, I need a spray bottle. I'm working awfully hard here. What the heck? The worst eraser ever. I still have my, sorry, I had a towel that was working better. Oh, I'll lay up and wash myself. Oh, there's a towel, yay. So what I'm planning on accomplishing today then is um, review where I'm hitting some high points of stuff you should already know, maybe a little bit of new information, and then we will move on to the next phylum. Why is this so hard to do? And I appreciate you just hanging out and keeping your focus the best you can. It's not been the year of people being able to focus very well, I know. So you just keep coming back to trying to do that. Why? Drop some philosophy on why later, maybe. Okay, oh, I do have two colors. I didn't know that. Happy day. That doesn't mean get up and run around. Oh, you hear cookies. All right. Let me feed the beast some cookies so she settles down. Milk bones, which she hates, but she will like anger eat them. She will look at me with spite and chew them up with like crumbs falling everywhere every now and then. It's kind of funny to watch because she's so disgusted with milk bones. And she's spoiled that she gets these things. All right. Let me hide one for you. Something to do with your time. To go scavenge, huh? How are y'all? I didn't even ask. Probably, probably ready for the day to end and the semester to end and all that good stuff. Of course, any year, maybe now more than ever. I don't know. All right, so let's just kind of look at the focus of being uh, sustained in our grades or getting points up. My preferred focus is that you, you're actually just kind of grooving on getting some sort of new information into your brain because that's what brains are there for is to gather information and you never know what you're going to use in the future and like I said uh, I'll try to throw a story about that in later yeah okay so uh, the first kingdom we addressed was sponges and we've gone over them as a group as well but there's a little bit of information I left out so I might as well go back a bit with them huh. So I showed you these, I stuck in the tank, I think, online, it's exciting. So a couple different uh, kinds of sponges here. This is more like the one that the woman injected, the doctor injected the dye into, the diver, marine biologist, and, and watched the dye come out. And we've talked about kind of how their bodies operate. And so these are organisms that, this should be in your notes. So what I do is flip back to your notes on sponges, would probably be a good place to put stuff. And the one I'm talking about, Nidaria, flip to your notes on corals and what's Nidaria corals and jellyfish. Remember the good old days when I just was killing time by us acting out with badminton and stage? I don't know, that's kind of goofy, but. Okay, so uh, what you know about these is these are organized on a cellular level, and what that means is the cells kind of fend for themselves for the most part. Each single cell can just do its own thing and get by fine without the other cells to a point. There's a small division of labor, but we don't look at them as having like um, highly organized tissue that partitions out um, the work. They certainly don't have any organs, so we're going to say they work at a cellular level, and you learned at least four cells that I had you take notes on, and there's, uh, I think, six types of cells listed on the, on the graphic that you may have written down, but I told you which ones to pay the most attention to. And we talked about them being uh, totipotent, that should be in your notes, meaning um, they stay stem cells their entire lives. Stem cells can differentiate into the other kinds of cells. So pretty easy when you only have, you know, roughly four or four to six kinds of cells in your body to differentiate into those four to six. It's not that complex of a system, so it's easy to do a fancy magic trick like that. Our cells are totipotent for the first few divisions, and then they quickly start losing that ability. Uh, stem cells that you think about, that you hear about being used in research from embryonic tissue, um, those are not totipotent. 
another term pluripotent, which means they can they can become many things, but not necessarily any any type of body cell that they're designed to become, that they have the genes to become. Okay, so, and then beyond talking about this being at a cellular level of organization, so if I ask you what level of organization, cellular, and at most, like, how do the cells talk to each other? We did talk about amoebocytes kind of sliming around, picking up food as they slime around, because that's what they do, and, like, I don't know how much they're actually like actively depositing food to another cell. I think it's more like they just are messy eaters and they drop crumbs along the way. And it, you know, as they travel, that allows other cells to pick it up. I mean, really, I think it's kind of how it works. And then the other thing is what kind of symmetry do they have? And that was one of the last questions I had you do uh, with the, with the uh, sub. Did anybody get that? Kind of symmetry. There's three kinds of symmetry. They got one of the three kinds. I'm right on board here. Sponges, I gotta remember my people. Sponges, what kind of symmetry do these sponges have? And I would say, don't let this one fool you into thinking, I don't know if you even looked up your symmetry, but you might notice on, on this dude, there's like a little hole here. I'm guessing that's where there was another bud. Remember that they can bud, that's one way they reproduce is they just keep branching off and those branches can break and become like float off and, and since they're toady potent, just keep growing and growing. Even if pushed through a sieve, even if you just crumbled one, I mean, these are dead, but you take one and crumbled it up, it could reconvene. But this doesn't have really a symmetrical shape. I mean, even though this piece itself looks a little symmetrical, it'd be more like this that has, you know, it could branch in various places. So again, what kind of symmetry do we call that? Asymmetrical or no symmetry, good, so. Periphera, do they have pores, right? Phylum periphera. Periphera, uh, we have cnidaria. And then the new one we're gonna just touch on today is, and then talk about more next time, is plate. Oh, menthes, that's a $20 word. Fun to say once you get used to saying it, plate, menthes, plate, menthes. I'll tell you what those are later. Oh, don't stand on the computer. You might like do a thing. I type something we don't want typed, huh? Yeah, please. I know you just left a notebook and you hate them. I know. Still survive. Oh, play help man. These. So we have asymmetrical. Here, let me draw a picture of a sponge. It'll be really pretty. <laughs> So my last class, I was doing a bang up job of writing upside down, but this goes faster. So give me just a minute. Asymmetrical and Nidaria. So let me have to draw a couple. See, erasing later and redrawing. Uh, what kind of symmetry do Nidaria have? Thank you. Was it really easy to do it the second time, or did you, uh, did you still have the old copy so you could just blast it out? I still watched the video, but I remember most of it. The worksheet? Did you still have that one? Oh, well, yeah. But I it's okay to use resources you have. So it's a lot. Well, back and check to make sure it's right, but. There you go. Okay. So radial symmetry. Pizza pie symmetry. Okay. There. Beautiful drawings. Platy helmet these, by the way. Platy is like a plate. Plates are flat, right? Draw some accoutrements on that thing. Give you something to think, wonder about. What's all that? Flatworm. Ah. Platy means flat. It's a flatworm. Flat. Flat like a plate. Hell means what it th you think it means, just like life in hell, because you're having to learn things like platy helminthes in, in school. And why would anybody ever need such stuff? And oh, is it and all that stuff. So platy helminthes. 
that so hell stands for what you're in right now in science you can appreciate a little humor and menthes is in hell of this the flatworms are eating some mentos you know minty goodness chews and no, this is true, but if you drew it out, if you drew that cartoon, you'd probably be able to remember the word really well, platy helminthes. That's fun to say. But the platy part does mean flat. That's like real. I'm not making that up. If you can't see, I can't guarantee that I'm going to keep pivoting the, the notes. So, so you, if you need to move, I apologize, but you may need to move. There's only so much song and dance I can do before I just like get cooked. Okay, so asymmetry means I can't draw a line somewhere on this and actually get two equal sides. I can't get two equal. I can't get two equal parts. Radial symmetry is like this. This has that's a bad example because I was using it to talk about my slide. So let me use this lid. This lid has radial symmetry because I can cut it like a pizza pie in all sorts of directions. And still get two equal parts, right? It's like a pizza pie. So these things are kind of orb shaped or cylindrical shapes. So if you think about a cylinder, look, I took art class. I could cut it this way or I could cut it that way, right? And you're going to get, however I cut it, you'd get two equal parts like this. Yeah? Makes sense? Okay. And then platyal menthes, they're like us. So they're flat. They got a left and a right. They got a left and a right eyeball. They even have a left and right, right little teeny tiny, really teeny tiny uh, uh, nerve cord going down them, two nerve cords. I can cut that thing. So if I were to slice myself in half for visual effect for you, you could just like cartoon that out and like the hatchet comes down. I don't know if you have the blood and gore version or just the, the cartoon version. Well, some cartoons are pretty gory. You know, the, the made for six year olds version when I just split in half. So I got a left eye, right eye, left ear, right ear, I, yeah, on hands, et cetera. That's called bilateral, two sides, right? So we're moving to most organ, most, most of our phyla are bilateral, almost all of them. There are three major ones that aren't. But from like here on out, as we talk about the more specialized things, almost all of them are bilateral. There'll be one exception. So the dog's bilateral, you're bilateral, birds are bilateral. Frogs are bilateral. Grasshoppers are bilateral, etc. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to focus on the cnidaria because that's what your work's been. So I'm going to get rid of this spongy stuff. I think I said what I wanted to say about them. No organs, no tissue. They're at a cellular level of organization. And then we change that up with these bad boys. Okay, so Nidaria, what's it called if the tentacles are pointed down? Tentacles down. Check your notes. You, you had a drawing you did, I believe, that you filled out. And I hope on your drawing, I hope as you did this, you, you did sketches and you wrote things in complete sentences, like I suggested, so you know what the heck it was in your journal, so you can use it, so I can give you full points. So this shape is a medusa and this shape is a polyp. Jellyfish adults are medusa. In a finer year, I would have I would hold you responsible for like all those intermediate, like the larval stages and stuff. But I can't tell you the jellyfish have a larval stage where they are a polyp and then they flip and become a medusa. That was in your reading. By the way, how'd you like that nice worksheet? That was lovely, wasn't it? I had to uh, group source that one. Or just not do it at all because that's that's like what the cool kids are doing, right? Not do it. A moment of empathy and silence for the fact that that's how us babies kids got to do most of our classes. We didn't get snowy videos. I don't know. <laughs> A few labs here and there. A whole lot of worksheets and chapter reviews. Ooh, reading books. Um, but one reason I wanted you to do that is um, for those who can appreciate uh, the academics to appreciate the level of reading you could be doing. That is a high school level book. Expectation to be able to muddle your way through such stuff. But here we are helping you out and keeping it oh so simple for you. Huh. Okay, so I did uh, throw in some anatomical language. 
if anybody's going into a medical career, if anybody's going to take anatomy and physiology, this is the beginning of anatomical language that doctors use. Okay. And this is a really basic animal, so there's not so many uh, directions to talk about, but there's an up and a down. So we have superior. <laughs> superior. And opposite of superior is. In. What's that? non-superior, or if you uh, answered that question, in inferior. If you answered it and then recalled, because you know, you go back in your notes and, and uh, check and see and study. So there's superior and there's inferior. And that works pretty good for jellyfish and for uh, coral reefs and Hydra, and who else was starring in your video? Who am I forgetting? Hydra, shoot. Can't think the name of the, I uh, see anemones. Okay. Most of those, by the way, are polyp as adults. Only the jellyfish I can think of are medusa as adults. So it works really well to just say, you know, depending on the organism, depending on what class it's in, what's up and down. Varies, so it's like what way is it mainly orienting as as and these are the adults again. I'm not talking about the larvae. It could be different with larvae. Okay. So I'm just spinning it's like this way or this way. And then a jellyfish is gonna like spend some time going sideways too, but it's mainly like this. If it's been struck by a jellyfish, that's a good time. Stepped on the war on the beach, been to the beach, hands up if you've been to the beach. Hand keep your hands up if you've snorkeled. Scuba dive, seen a coral reef. I think coral reefs are reasonably cool, having seen them. So here's where I'll put a plug in for learning things that seem unimportant in life. So I, I was uh, raised, uh, I was raised, oh, it's gonna be one of those stories from grandma. Uh, I went to South High School and I lived in a, um, part of town that was not particularly wealthy. We were kind of lower middle class, not a lot of money in the family, didn't go to prom because I couldn't buy a dress. I mean, I didn't buy a, a letter jacket because that was expensive. Didn't buy a ring because that was expensive, okay? So, so modest means, and I really wanted to not spend my life there, which is why I studied and went to college. It's not because I just adored school or anything. It's like, but I, I, I saw it as a means to get myself up and out. I don't know, students these days, I don't know if you can see that sort of an outlook of if I do this, then I'll get that. Or if you have that need for it. I don't know that you have that because maybe your parents can help you out to to the extent that, that that's not a concern for you, I don't know. But here's how it worked out for me. I did not know I was gonna become a biologist, but I was pretty good in biology. I was better in English, but that didn't so much appeal. I like to write. So when I went to college, I was more interested in art. So I thought about a dual degree. And then I thought, how am I going to make a living at art? So I took the practical route because I came from a family that was practical because they needed to be because they didn't have much money. This is boring, I know. But let me get to this area of we don't of unpredictability, and it's this. You don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen for you. I can't tell you what's a value for you. But please don't think only things that seem to have a direct beeline to value are important. If I felt that way, then I'd be spending this entire year, we could just study viruses and directly apply COVID. And I think you would really get tired of that. I don't think we need that in our life. Sometimes what we need is just something a little off kilter and weird, and you can just file it in the why, why are we doing this? And that's okay. Because originally that's what, 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 what academics was kind of about, was learning stuff for the love of learning. We kind of lost that. But here's how it worked out for me. In college, I overheard somebody saying that there was a job opening at the zoo third shift. At the time, I managed to find a way to work for a veterinarian. So I had a little bit of experience. And I'm a pretty good salesperson. So I sold myself as somebody who would be a great third shift, vet, uh, of, of third shift zookeeper to somebody who didn't think I would. And I talked him into it. And then I kept talking people into how I would be the appropriate person until they promoted me, promoted me, and promoted me until I was a curator. And then I got to world travel, particularly in the Caribbean, but I've been to a dozen countries as far as Fiji. 
and I've scuba dived in Fiji. And I got scuba certified on the Ziz Dine because they needed somebody who was uh, certified because you see, we have these volunteers that, that dive and clean out, you know, the, the tropical building. So there are these volunteers who for years and years and years have cleaned out that lake. But then OSHA caught wind of it, that zoos were doing that, not just our zoos, but other zoos. OSHA uh, is a, a regulatory body over, over workers, usually in maintenance type jobs. And said, so that's illegal, you can't do that. What if that, that very skilled scuba diver drowns in your lake? You have to have people on the job who are paid, who are scuba certified. And so they paid me to get scuba certified because I was already working in the Caribbean, they paid me to get scuba certified in St. Lucia. So when I'm trying to answer to you, why would you ever learn something that you don't see a direct relationship to? Very interesting back there, huh? I could just tell you, I don't know, but maybe you should, because I can't predict your outcome, but I hope it's not completely linear and boring and you just keep working to make the next dollar and, and, and running away in your life. And if you leave a little bit of uh, wackiness in your world, then maybe some of that wackiness will be of use. Maybe not. That's interesting. Sitting like polyps. Okay, so in your video, yeah, a type of polyp that was kind of chunky on the bottom, starfish comes after him. That's my favorite part. If I was feeling better, I'd do what I did last year and like show you the animated version. Would you like to do it for me? Probably not. Yeah. It, it just takes like a complete lack of self-respect to do some of the things I do to be a, a teacher. But anyway, starfish comes after this thing and you learn, lo and behold, he's quite mobile. These are animals that can move. So to be able to move, you got to start having a network of information that can flow from one part of the animal to the other. They have that. So these animals have a nerve net. This is stuff for you to know. This is priority information as far as I'm concerned. So here I have a hair net to help you imagine a nerve net. And a hair net just has all these fine little, if you can imagine those being cells, nerve cells that are networked with each other. And there's not, if we ignore the boundaries here, there's not some that are thicker than others. They're just kind of all equally, they're a net, right? And if you can make that a little more three-dimensional so that it goes into the interior. So if I did a, a sketch similar to what you must have done at the bottom of your worksheet, you had this thing has a mouth with that tentacle in it. Not a very useful place because I'm going to put a mouth in here. Has a mouth, has a gastric cavity. Gastric cavity has some enzymes in it. Oh, so, and this is uh, operating at a tissue level of organization is kind of what I'm getting at. It has an epidermis on the outside, it has a gastrodermis on the, uh, uh, kind of where the gastric cavity is, it's like a cul-de-sac. Okay, so it has kind of different layers of tissue. And within this part where the mesophyll is, where the body of the animal is, is this nerve net. So it's not just along the surface. It's not just like jellyfish wearing a, a net on its head. I'll do this with special effect. Oops, I have no shame. You'd have to imagine this penetrating into my brain as well, right? Networked into my deep tissue. But what does that do for the animal? Makes it look like a cafeteria worker. Also, if a little fishy is nibbling on one end of that jellyfish, nibbling over here, it's going to cause the other part of the network to react, which means it can get information for the whole jellyfish to do what it needs to do. That might be to skedaddle, to run away. It might be to attack and sting with its special organ that it's named for. <laughs> okay. Stinger, that's not what it's called. Okay. But now we have a network. So this is a tissue level of organization. This isn't the cells over here. Don't really know what's going on with the cells over here. This is a tissue level of organization, which you should write down in your notes about Nidaria is that they're at a tissue level of organization and that they have a nerve net as an example of that tissue level of organization that allows cells to communicate end to end on that animal. Nerve 
at Yippers. I don't know about this lovely paper that y'all worked on. Because oh, I needed something to key off on. You know what else? I'm wondering why I still have my mask on. I'm outdoors. I'm going to keep this up for a while. Just to help me look more ridiculous, I guess. I got the net on. Oh, I lost the net. Oh, it's still hanging off in here. That's all right. Didn't all right. So knowing that you've written this all and got this stuff done, good for you. Let me just go over um, parts that are more important than other parts for you to have. I will grade the whole thing, of course. I will look for completion on this and that you don't use the exact same words as somebody else does or even just turn a few words around to be cute because I can actually tell when you're doing that. So please do your own work. Delightful. All right. So things to emphasize on this versus things that you can kind of let go of some because we, we're not going to emphasize everything. You should know what a polyp and a medusa are and which is which. I, I said that backwards, a medusa and a polyp. You should know which is which, cup up or cup down. Okay. Also, uh, number. so what I do is next to these, I'm just going to go down the vocabulary re review one through five, the multiple choice one through five, and then the short answer one to five and let you know. And I'd suggest you just put stars next to things because then you can key on them faster in your journal. Yeah? All right. So number one, polyp and medusa. Put a star next to your answer to what polyp and medusa are. Okay. It's these body shapes. And then another one is epidermis and gastrodermis. Epidermis, is, I have an epidermis. This is my epidermis. So we're getting into, again, an anatomical type language that, that holds true for our bodies. So we can start finding some usefulness in this. And so epidermis is here. Gastrodermis, gastro is like gastrointestinal. It means digestive. So it has a gastrodermis. So it has two layers of tissue. If you write down it has two layers of tissue, that cannot do anything but help you. It won't harm you that it has two layers of tissue. And then number three, the mesoglea is like the, the mushy stuff on the inside of the body. And you don't need to know uh, mesoglea and uh, plan planula. So you don't need to star that. Great that you read it. We can leave it for now. You become a jellyfish expert. By the way, I may be uh, one of the one or the closest thing to a marine biologist in, in your community. So students who think they want to become a marine biologist, I didn't. But I did work in the Caribbean as a biologist. So I was working with land animals, but guess what I did on my downtime? I spent a lot of time in the water. And I worked on uh, how many? Seven of the islands. Spent a fair amount of time. Didn't know I was going there. Not saying you'd go there. I'm just saying, don't know what's going to unfold in your life. Expect the unexpected. Enjoy the ride. Keep a sense of humor. All right. Number four. You do know, need to know what nidocytes and nematocysts are. Remember the word site, C-Y-T-E, means cell. So you've already learned amoebocytes, porocytes, nacocytes, and... I can't believe I lost the word. Even off those protozoans. Coana, coanocytes. Cytin cell. That's four cells you need to know in sponges. Here's one you need to know. Nidocyte, you should be able to recognize as being belonging to this, um, this uh, phylum. And here's why. Nidocyte, look at how that's spelled. C-N-I-D-O-C-Y-T-E. Look at the word nidaria. So the word nidaria comes from nidocyte. And it's a little bit of a stretch, but if you look at the word from your list on number four, nematocyst, these also show up on number one on your short answer. And I, I think somebody said they were a vocabulary on the, on the video as well. Okay. So um, nematocysts, if you put a C in front of that word, it used to have a C in front of it. They took it off, right? Over time, I don't know, the C got dropped. But those words are related to the word nidaria. So nidaria is named for these stinging um, tentacle type things that come out of a specialized cell. The, the nidocyte is the specialized cell and the nematocyst is the stingy thing, whip-like, and comes out, gets you. 
I want to take a minute on this. Oh, I'll do it later because the shit comes up on this. Never mind. So, number five, I, I'm not going to have you worry about coloblast and apical organ. I mean, fill it out on your paper because it's fourth of grade, but we're not going to concentrate on that because that has to do with that phylum, Tinophora, which was just kind of like a throw in on this. Box jellies are kind of related, closely related, but we can't do everything. On multiple choice, cnidarians and tinophores are more complex than sponges because unlike sponges, I want you to modify this. Unlike sponges, they have tissue. They're at the tissue level of organization, but scratch out the end organs. I'm not willing to consider this gastric cavity an organ. Most, most uh, things you would read would not. So I disagree with this uh, little worksheet on that. So they have tissues. They're at a tissue level of organization is the way you would say that. So number one, a multiple choice, they are at a tissue level of organization. How do they coordinate their activities with a nerve net, which I've already explained. That's important, I'd start one and two. Three, example of Nidarian class hydrozoa. There's an answer there, you can answer it. <laughs> but I'm not gonna say, and I'm not going to this year, I had you, I held you responsible for classes of, of, of these things the last year, but that was last year, this year we're skipping it. Corals exist in a symbiotic relationship with algae, which is why when we cloud up the water with pollution, coral reefs start to die because if they don't have their algae to photosynthesize, to feed, to bring in little foods for them to eat, they die. And we call that coral bleaching. They turn white, they die. All the color drains out and they're dead. But that is sad. And some upbeat news that um, one of my students gave me last block. So let's, let's uh, turn that to happy is that in Australia, she reminded me, she's been out to uh, snorkeling before, so this is a, you know, she, she notices that information. And, and that, um, that uh, biologists are working to, um, there are ways to recover coral reef, you know, planting artificial things for the, for the fishies to move in on until the corals can rebuild and stuff. And they've been working on that at this time of COVID because there are fewer people, there's uh, tourism is down and therefore we're giving those reefs a break and, and they are recovering. So that's, that's some promising news. Maybe we can use um, that information in the future to give them times to rest and not keep getting trashed okay and so number five again is about tina four so that's not an emphasis don't need to start that on the short answer is number one definitely know that know what a pneumatocyst is how it works differences between hydras and other hydrozoans don't worry about it i mean answer it but it's not on our priority list Dominant body form, again, this has to do with different classes, but, you know, just remembering that there are life cycles and that it's, you know, they, in the uh, dominant body form, they'd be talking really about the adult and when you don't need to memorize that. Uh, I like the symbiosis question. So we talked about one symbiosis. This get, there's another one that was listed, so star number four. How do coral polyps produce in a coral reef? All right, so that's what I was gonna, I was gonna sketch that out. Mm. Cause I think this can be confusing. Even if I had some corals to hand around, I don't wanna just wave them around cause one, they're kind of small and I don't know why else. You kind of have to feel them to get the difference between sponge and coral in some ways. Cause they branch off too. They kind of can look, some of them kind of look like this. So I'm gonna make something that looks somewhat branchy. And instead of being a sponge, it's a coral. But what you gotta understand is this thing I'm holding up, this piece is actually, this whole, is an animal. This is a, this whole thing is an animal. On a coral reef, this whole thing is not the, the animal. This is like a statue of dead bodies. So it's the remnants of corals of these little polyps that, that kind of, build on each other, and then there are these pockets. They look like the pores on the sponge, but they're bigger. They're not pores. What they are are like little hidey holes for the actual corals to live in. So the structure would have hundreds, I don't know, thousands of corals, and they live in the little openings. <laughs> 
So it's like a high rise apartment and the polyps stick out of here. And if you go snorkeling, you don't always see them. Or if you go diving, you don't always see them because they can retract in. The tentacles can retract in, retract in and they hide. And not, most of them are nocturnal. So if you go night diving, then you'll see them out feeding and they'll throw their the nematocysts out and sting a little fishy coming by, paralyze it, bring it in, nom, 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 digest it. Or if you're swimming too close to it, it'll sting you, <laughs> which will teach you as a mammal, as an animal that can learn and remember to keep the heck away from it next time. Tell all your friends not to get too close to a coral fire, or a fire uh, coral, sorry, because fire corals will sting the tar out of you, okay? So the polyps are actually hanging out here. They blow their little nematocysts out and they bring their little tentacles out at night usually. And so I would like you to know about that. That's number five, critical thinking. I always like when you think critically, so I'll just leave that open. I talked about a similar um, symbiotic relationship. So, and then uh, so six, I'd like you to at least answer well. And, and then uh, the drawing at the bottom. Again, mesoglea of the, of the several things that are listed. Mesoglea is uh, just kind of spongy fill. I won't ask any questions about mesoglea. It helps put everything else in perspective. But I want you to know what epidermis is. I want you to know what the gastrovascular cavity is with its enzymes, the cold de sac with its enzymes. It helps the animal digests food in two ways. So it's got this mouth, and by the way, the pie hole is the same as the poo hole. I, think I asked that about the mouth and the anus at the end. Food in, food out. So it's just water rushing in, and, and it carries bacteria and other little tidbits of food, and what doesn't get digested and the waste material just washes out the same way. Because it's a little bit of cul-de-sac here, when the... When get to work and there's a lot of surface area here to allow um, the digested the material to start moving inward to uh, various cells okay. so pie hole equals poo hole as I like to put it and what do I have left anything Oy. Gastrodermis, that's the layer of cells that line to create cavity. Gastrocavity is the cavity that where the water's flowing in and out and where the enzymes are kind of, uh, enzymes are kind of tied into the cells here, but I bet there's some free roaming ones too. Uh, what am I, a Nidaria expert? I'm not. And tentacles, just because it's kind of hard to talk about them if you can't say what those little things are hanging, you know. So, so tentacles a useful word, just so I can refer to the tentacles that are sticking out here and tentacles up or down, superior or inferior. Mouth v anus, you should, well, it's not versus mouth slash anus, you should know that. It's usually referred to as the mouth because no one's comfortable about talking about anuses yet, but oh, we will in this class. Oh, we talk about anuses a lot in this class. Just you wait, just you wait. And that this again is the Medusa form. Any questions on that? I was looking at the eraser to see what time it is, but I think I'll check my phone instead. Oh, my phone's dead. What time is it, folks? Seven, okay, good. That gives us a good amount of time to go in and do the next little phase of this. You may. Questions on that? Man, I went really slow on my uh, third block on that. Because <laughs> I'm just slow getting this out here, I guess. Look at us now. So online folks, there's a good chance I will shut this down and pull it back up. If I'm very smart, maybe I couldn't get it all in without doing that. But we will reconvene inside in just a couple minutes. Once we're in, I'll ask you if you have any questions. Could I have someone uh, bring the whiteboard for me? Yeah, someone who is not going to go directly to the bathroom. <laughs> or that, or just drop it off outside my class on the way to the bathroom. Don't take it to the bathroom and be weird and gross at the same time. Uh, no! While I'm in the beer. No! 
Yeah. I still have a hair net dangling off of me. I bet I do. Uh, I don't know if it's on here anyway, so whatever. Yeah. Grab a jab on the right now. Oh. <laughs> All right, this is me actively trying to not my computer. And then I have to walk with coordination. I don't know. It's a lot. Not drop my computer. All right, folks. Hello. That's in the hallway. Um, could put my avatar on, but this is so exciting for you. I'm sure. You're stealing. Yeah, I have to look at my shirt, which is really weird. <sighs> Pretty blue sky, such a nice blue sky. Probably have to unlock this. And not drop my computer at the same time. Dang, I have to unlock it. So I got this. Of course, it's not going to stick. It never does. Oh, puppers. Where do you want to put it? Uh, just slide it in there. You would. Onliners, were you able to follow along fairly well? I hope you have any questions for me. Yeah. We're going to start up in just a couple minutes. So please, if you have need to go to the restroom or something, do it quickly. <laughs> All right. Onliners, were you able to hear me out there? I hope. They've all gone away. We could hear you. <laughs> okay. Can you see the board sometimes? Yeah, we yeah. could see it. Woohoo! I felt like a great success then. All right. Yeah, quickly. So, a couple things left to do. Just a handful of notes that are already on the board. I'll talk about your moving stuff. Gonna move into the next phylum and we're gonna watch about 10 minutes of video and we'll be done. So do I have enough battery power to do this? Maybe not. <laughs> All right, so we're moving on to a new phylum that I mentioned outside briefly. It has bilateral symmetry, and you know what that means now. 
and it also has organization at the organ system level. So we go from tissue level. Some people would argue tissue organ level. I'm not comfortable with that. Because really, I feel like if you have something as complex as an organ, something we're going to call an organ, it really needs to be able to communicate with some other stuff. So you kind of just tumble right into, if there are organs, there will be an organ system. So there will be some complex uh, bit of, and an organ, uh, really it's, it's more complex, it's tissue that's a little more complex and sometimes has multiple kinds of tissue. Like your heart will have a, a smooth muscle and uh, well, cardiac muscle and and some uh, lining type stuff, kind of like the epidermis of the uh, of the cnidaria, and so it just has these different components to make it into its vessel, visible tool. And so, I have an example of organ system up here. I'm also trying to find my camera at the same time. So. So I'm hoping my online, look like you guys can see this, Pretty Helminthes. If I squish it over a little bit this way. Okay, so within this five and Pretty Helminthes, uh, the, the common name for them is flatworms. The platy means uh, like plate-like, so flat, the flat of the flatworm. <laughs> Helminthes means something too, but I like my explanation. Forms. And they're at the organ system level of organization. And then I gave the example of the nervous system, which I think I gave outside too, didn't I? So that they have a primitive brain is kind of a term I don't like to use for them, but we're scurrying through this quickly. Uh, online, I have the fancier one for people who like fancy terms, like those of you who think you're going to be in medical career. <laughs> Ganglia. I probably will bring that up next time because I, I do like a few nerve work terms. They got eye spots. You can just imagine those are primitive eyes because they are primitive eyes, primitive brain. Centralized nervous system. So here's the advantage with this. Instead of there being, let's say like there's a fire at the house over on this block and these are all just gravel roads and nobody has a phone and like so the emergency uh, 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 vehicles need to get over there. It's just like there's just you know, this route's about the same as this route's about the, you know, uh, but there's no fast way of getting the information. This is more like uh, Ohio Street versus the side roads. You can move faster through Ohio Street, right? So we got two similar parallel streets to Ohio Street. Look, they're coming right from the eyeballs. Why? Because you have, you have optic nerves coming right from your eyeballs too. They cross and end up in the back of your brain. So we're seeing like the beginning of an eye, you know, idea of having and then there's this brain like blob this, this condensed nerve package of nerves at the at the front part of it too so that's one example of of an organ system within this little worm okay with with these three components and from there i think that leaves us leaves us a video to watch so i'll give you just a minute to pull that up and felt like i was coming over here to do something Oh, yeah, I was going to set up the camera for my onliner so I can see it Maybe a little better. So um, by, on your way out, I probably will forget to move this out of your way. So if you're on the, if you're on the wall side of the room, careful not to trip over or bang yourself up on this on the way out. I'll have to roll it back around if you want. Oh, my camera will be on. Don't knock my camera over. Uh, don't knock each other over to get out of here. You might knock this over too. Let's <laughs> so, put this on and oh, refine the positioning. Maybe that looks pretty good. All right. So I think I got this posted today. A YouTube version of this 10 minute video. It's a shape of life, just like the other ones were. Same, same series. Plugged in. Yeah. All right, shape of life.
So the one I'm pulling up is from the Shape of Life website, which weirdly I think is blocked for you. It must be in like a, if it's in like a, a WordPress format or something, we can't get those unblocked. So I, I don't think you have access to this. This, but I have it posted, uh, the, the YouTube version posted, so you can rewatch if you want or need to. What a pretty worm. Who to thunk? Pretty worm. And I'll just volume as soon as I get going here. And hopefully my computer's not in your way. If so, like just need to step, move yourself a tiny bit. Scientists believe there is an animal living today that gives us a good idea of what that ancient trailblazing ancestor looked like. This animal is a platform. They may be among the most obscure animals on Earth, but near the base of our family tree, a similar creature was the first to move with intent to explore the world, to hunt. And their direct descendants have spread to every corner of the world. Scientists have described about 20,000 different species of flatworms so far, tenaciously surviving in almost every environment, on land, in the oceans, in freshwater ponds, and in the strangest habitat of all, inside the bodies of other animals. The development of the hunter is one of evolution's great success stories. Like many flatworms today, the modern planarian is a smooth hunting machine. But so too were its ancestors, and they lived over half a billion years ago. An ancient worm was the first to develop a new type of nervous system, a centralized one, hooked up to sensors at one end of the body. This was the first animal with a head, within it, a first brain. In that head were some stunning innovations, a pair of eyes. Eyes that could sense both the intensity of light and the direction from which it came. Placing sense organs near the brain helped fire signals to the rest of the body at top speed. Those signals could spark a sturdy set of muscles running down and around the entire body. These muscles, along with millions of tiny cilia, propelled the worm on a power glide over a self-made cushion of slime. The talent for the heart is a legacy from the ancient worm, the first animal to have sensor arms in stereo. Two eyes two nostrils, two ears. Stereo senses allow a hunter to sense exactly where its prey is, 
by triangulation, then react and adjust in mere fractions of a second. The mouth of the flatworm, oddly, is not in its head. It's on the underside of the body. From this mouth, the flatworm launches a device called the pharynx, which it uses to suck down its prey. As the planarians scavenge a fish, the pharynx goes into action. Once inside, food moves through a gut so extensive it reaches to every square millimeter of the flatworm's body. Some of the most sensational sexual habits in the animal world are found in the sandy shallows of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Over millions of years, some flatworms here have developed remarkable sexual equipment and strange ways to go with it. In fact, the first hunter was also the first animal with an internal system to deliver sperm to an egg. Basic internal fertilization changed the shape of life. The flatworm's ancestor combined the ability to move with a new way to mate. These innovations still define our sexual lives today. We may never know what the first animal courtship was like, but these flatworms can show us how even simple animals add their own twist. For them, sex is more like war than love. It's known as penis fencing, and the worms are the swordsmen. From the midsection of each flatworm, double daggers protrude. Each dagger is actually a penis. The first one who can make a successful jab delivers its sperm. Sperm can be injected anywhere on the skin where it's then absorbed. The losing flatworm must then bear the burden of motherhood, committing valuable resources to having offspring. Flatworms are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female sex organs. Being hermaphroditic is a great strategy to maximize the chances to reproduce. Primordial worms may seem simple, but they were the first animals to pursue food and sex. They changed the shape of life on Earth. More than half a billion years of evolution separate these modern animals from ancient worms. Yet even the most powerful beasts today are still built on the same plan, bilateral, with a head and a tail, and sophisticated stereo senses directed by a brain. Worms were the first animals built with this blueprint, and the same basic design builds a human today. It may be hard to believe, but humans and flatworms have a lot in common. 
cells in a developing human are told when, where, and how to grow. All because an ancient worm was the first to assemble the genetic instructions for building this brand new kind of body. And it all began eons ago with a body that went out into the world and conquered. So the first few cell divisions in all animals is extremely similar. So when they're saying that here we've laid the groundwork for the development of even complex animals. And we'll look at that, uh, I guess next class period, we'll look at uh, some developmental biology a little bit. You can see how that ties in. So if you ever just need some slow brood documentary with some kind of eye candy imagery, the shape of lives, shape of the lives. I know that's not for every song you're like, what? I would never do that. But and the shape of life videos are really nice to look at. Pretty slow moving, but sort of calming. I think they tell a good story. So the, the full ones are like 50 minutes long and these are excerpts from them. All right, folks. Thank you for focusing your attention pretty dang well today. I appreciate that. Good to see you again. I miss getting around you. And online folks, do you have any questions for me? Uh, you can go ahead and start heading out. I'll stick around in case anyone does have a question. Any questions for me? Oh, yeah, thank you for wiping down, folks. I'd like to think that the overnight period takes care of it, but we just aren't, that's not 100% fail proof. So, appreciate you taking care of each other. Kara, I like your new hair color. I know, my gosh. Car, I got it right earlier. It's so close to Karen. And that's I'm and nobody wants to be a Karen these days, but I kind of am accidentally. Kara, Kara, Kara. I was explaining this. It was just the other day I was talking about Zara and Kara.